like uh, the previous presentation, uh, I will uh, use ISSG work to sort of frame these osteotomies. And I'll just start with um, the, this descriptor. If, if we're really talking about a significant deformity in the cervical spine, uh, it's important to, I think, primarily to say, where is the major deformity? Is it in the spine? Is it at the CVJ? Or is it more often upper thoracic? Uh, so uh, I just mentioned that. Uh, but there are no, all sorts of numbers that we can use and measurements we can use to say, uh, if we're just talking cervical, what are the alignment parameters? Certainly we have to consider the entire spine, but if we, we focus in the upper part, uh, we could measure two dozen parameters. And I think these are reasonable things to start with. And even if it's a several level DGEN case, uh, you should do your best to maintain or reachieve what is normal lordosis. And so I think for the, for the average a uh, surgeon out there that has uh, mild to moderate degenerative uh, abnormalities, these are things to measure. Certainly, if you have a real significant deformity, then uh, a lot more work needs to be done, and we have to consider uh, full radiographs. Flexibility is important. Uh, if, you, if you have a fixed chin on chest, it's a totally different animal than if it's flexible and it can reduce without uh, osteotomies. It's important to know the apex and, and always the neurologic status. And I'll say that if you have a myelopathic patient that's kyphotic, that kyphosis alone stretches and, and, and adds to the core dysfunction. So in addition to decompression, correction of kyphosis here would be expected to help optimize the chance of removing the neurologic deficit. We use this ISSG uh, nomenclature going from less invasive to more invasive as the framework, and I'm just going to walk through these uh, Describe them briefly and maybe mention a few uh, surgical things that I've found along the way. So the first one is just a partial osteotomy. And it's it's either your standard ACDF, leaving most of the uncinate, you'll take away the uncinate spur, or a posterior uh, facet release, or maybe even medial facetectomy. And here's an example. This person is stiff. You can see uh, even in the extension film, they can't, uh, the, the neutral on the left and then the extension, they're flexible, but not completely. And this was really done, the correction was done anteriorly with multi-level discectomies and uh, uncinate releases. And then the posterior instrumentation was just to help lock it down. So this would be sort of, although multiple segments in grade one. And for me, if you really release it and it, it's stiff, but not, but not too stiff, you can get some extra correction with, with the plate. And my technique is if you, if you look at the middle ones, if you, you need to start your screws in the center of the construct, because as you pull the spine toward the plate, the association of the upper and lower edges of the plate change relative to the spine. So if you lock down the top and bottom, uh, then you're, you're not allowing the spine to freely move into this lordotic position on the plate. Uh, I use, I put two screws in each level and my assistant and I turn the screws at the same time so that we spread the force out uh, uh, to, draw, to draw the uh, spine in. Um, and I, I like for the, the correction, it, uh, some of it you, you want to break from the front. So you resect the uncinate. And we all, if you have a flexible spine, we can put the pins in and we have a nice, uh, nice uh, result like this. But if it's stiff and not too flexible, then this is what's going to happen. For me, to put inner body distractors in, usually this is an example with two. And there's only one, but we'll put a second one in lateral with solid tough bone is, and again, spreading the forces, both uh, crank this at once until it, it pops open, and then, then we know we can get uh, the lordosis. And another, if the wound is deep, uh, then there are powerful uh, arthroplasty distractors that I would encourage you to use. Now, Brian and uh, Proto-C also has a very powerful, uh, with a big footprint distractor that you can use to break this open from the front. But with these, the correction's gotten from the front. And then we move posterior. This is uh, the same thing, only uh, releases from behind. And here's a patient. This is an old patient. You can see instead of uh, rods, it's a plate. But you'd look at that and say, well, look at all this in the front. It can't be done from the back. We have, I want to do a laminectomy and is able to uh, at least get uh, a straight spine, maybe a touch lordosis. It's not great, but uh, uh, multiple levels. And, and so this kind of work can be done in the back. Next, next is just a standard corpectomy. I am not a fan of corpectomies in general. I probably only do a couple a year. 
de novo, uh, because I think you can do a lot of work through the inner space. Uh, but if you're presented with something like this, you're going to have to do a multi-level corpectomy. And so this is just an example of a uh, corpectomy situation. Now, we get to this grade four. This is an anterior release, but it's a complete anterior release across the inner space. So all of the uncinate needs to go. And as you know, the, the real issue here is how lateral do we go? When might we entertain uh, a potential issue with the vertebral artery? Um, here's an example. Again, this correction was all done from the front. And, and also, I mean, it's not lordotic, but uh, this old gentleman, this was uh, good enough. He had myelopathy. Um, and the unstates were taken, and this thing broken open with these interspinous uh, distractors that I was talking about, and then locked down from behind. This is, uh, this is Dan Rue's technique. Dan likes to put uh, a Penfield 1 or free or lateral to the vertebral body uh, along the uncinate, and then working from the inner space laterally, this, this distractor, this, this instrument will help protect one. There's a sheet of metal from the instrument between you and the vertebral. Um, it can work. You have to make certain that you don't have uh, vertebral arteries with uh, calcification in the wall or some degree of atherosclerosis, but it is a technique to help one avoid a vertebral artery injury when doing this complete unsuccessful. Uh, grade five is the anterior release. This is the classic uh, Simmons type uh, procedure. So here we have patient uh, chin on chest, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, and uh, these these for me these would be done in the sitting position. If you flip this man over, his head's going to be sitting on the floor, and it's it's just uh, tough to do. So I do I do the opening. We we do complete. Um, over two levels, uh, open up completely over the nerve root. Uh, ideally, you're going to be below C7. Uh, and then if you have them in this Mayfield like this and you just loosen it and try to crack it back, you, you can't really do it. You really should disconnect it. And I tend to put the screws in and the stylet from a uh, ET tube, a small stylet loosely in the screws, and it helps minimize the possibility of AP translation. Another technique would be to use one of the uh, hinged rods. But the problem with this is, despite doing all of this, here's this man. So we get, we stop, we, we kind of stop our, uh, our action at only 30 degrees correction, because you can see we're still getting this AP translation and it becomes worrisome. Uh, but this technique in, in the right situation is very powerful. And also this man can't be done from the front. Uh, you, you don't have access as long as that chin is down there. Uh, and, and so here, here we see, uh, it's, it's hard to visualize, he's so big, but this is our correction. Um, then the grade six, this is the PSO. Uh, here shown at C7, uh, you have to, the C8 nerve root in play here, so you could go at T1, then you have T2 nerve root, uh, but as you get down lower, you have the ribs and it gets a little deeper, so it's uh, however you want to do it. Uh, here's a patient had a OC fusion, and we can see the SVA of 64. Uh, patient's miserable. So this actually I did in the front. I did some stuff in the front to begin with, but then uh, then it flipped them over and uh, did this PSO. What I want to show on here is if we if we look at where my arrow is, there's what you're left with. You're left with just a wafer of bone in here. It's not, you're starting with a small vertebral body and you're left with practically nothing. So you can get it corrected, but uh, it's, uh, it's a, you know, you're starting to add multiple rods and worry about fusion across the segment. And, uh, and that's the real problem with the, with the PSO here. And finally, grade seven is complete uh, VCR here done uh, front and back. Uh, and, and these are more extreme in the cervical spine. Here's a patient with a fixed deformity, pseudomeningocele, a lockdown like this. And here we are working with this uh, expandable cage after we released, took everything out from the front over three segments and everything out from the back and, and trying to get this thing cranked up so we can lock down the bottom part of the plate. These are extreme measures in the cervical spine and, uh, and uh, it, it, it usually more rarely done unless one is down in the upper thoracic spine and doing perhaps a VCR just to get better correction uh, there. And so with that, uh, I think I'll be on time. Uh, and, and, you know, here's the DGEN case for the, the standard stuff we do all the time. And, and of course, the goal here is this patient with, oops, with all this pain, uh, 
the goal is if, if we can get them aligned, us just flipping forward, uh, then uh, you can see that, that we got the top adjusted. And this is probably the patient neurologic deficit, but the neck pain was probably driven by this hyperextension at 0112. And you get them in the right alignment and that relaxes and, and you have a happy patient. With that, uh, I will bid you farewell from Chicago and be happy to answer any questions if there's still time. That's perfect. Uh, we do have uh, a few uh, minutes uh, for questions. Uh, we've got one from Jens Chapman, uh, my partner here in Seattle. Vince, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, from a fan in Seattle, beautiful slides, beautiful talk. Uh, my question is always, when I see these significant deformity corrections, where do we stop on the top, where do we stop on the bottom? We'd obviously like to preserve C1, C2 in the occiput, C1 motion, if at all possible. Um, but uh, do we stop at C2? Do we go down to T2? I saw kind of a mix of uh, everything in your slides. Obviously, there are different uh, underlying pathologies. Sometimes you stopped at T1, sometimes you went down to T11. Uh, so just give us some words of wisdom of what's a safe harbor top versus bottom. I agree with you at the top. If Almost everything, I'm going to go to two because you've got great, great screws you can put into two. Uh, but at all, if at all possible, uh, avoid uh, one going to one, and even more if, if you have a long construct. Just that little bit of flexion extension we have at O1 helps patients uh, buffer the stiffness of their spine. So two is the top for me, unless there's really CVJ pathology. Um, if I have multiple levels, I never stop at seven. I go at least to T1 or T2. I, I just don't want to stop at the junction where we've got the stiff thoracic spine. Now I've got a long construct. And then where, where it goes, uh, it depends on the pathology. It depends uh, if there's been a failure, how I'm trying to revise it. I don't want to stop at the apex. I, uh, I'm, and more and more now, I'm, I'm taking it down to T2 or T3. I mean, I mean initially, you can have, as, you, as you, you all know from TL work, you can have great post-op films, and then six months later, uh, it's distal failure, and things are pulling out. So now I go down more to T2 or T3, unless there's a reason that I'm, I'm doing uh, a revision and blocking down more. I know it's not a good answer, but it is individualized. But uh, avoid CBJ if you can. Vince, I would underline the, those were just some incredible cases. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, your use of uh, spinal cord monitoring in these cases? And, and in particular, the ang spawn patient you showed, um, when, when, when that technique was developed, I know the, uh, Henry Bullman and others uh, actually used the, used, it kept the patient awake. Uh, do you see any role for that or are you satisfied with just monitoring? I, that case, I just used monitoring in that case. Um, I, I don't think I've ever, other than an awake turn to prone, I don't think I've ever done an awake cervical case. I, in fact, I know I haven't. Um, for some of these degenerative cases, I know this is very controversial. Let's say it's really not a significant deformity, but they're kyphotic over four segments. I normally don't monitor them. I, st I, I do them anterior. I don't have to reposition them. I, I'm not making that much correction, but, but if you're making any sort of, there, there are two things that will monitor, serious correction and length of surgery. So some of these back front backs, there's a long period of time uh, where you don't really have an exam and you do one end and you're working on the other and things go away and, and it happened to me once. It was a clot on the other side that I had, after I had flipped. And uh, that was a little, actually we ended up scanning because we looked around, couldn't figure out how this possibly could happen, and it was a hematoma that developed behind C7 anteriorly, uh, down the front and flipped them. And so uh, long cases, monitoring, you have no exam, monitoring can help you in certainly significant deformity or some sort of cord manipulation you want to monitor. Yeah. I had the identical experience in an angst patient with a posterior uh, hematoma as we were finishing uh, a fracture stabilization from the front. So uh, definitely uh, should, uh, worth noting. I think Jens has one more question, then we're going to need to break for the, uh, the, next dem the first live demonstration here from the cadaver lab. 
<laughs> Unmuted. Vince, one more question. C5 policies. Uh, in some uh, very uneventful deformity corrections, I've had some C5 policies. Very frustrating subject for me, for the patients. Usually goes away with time, but any words of wisdom of how to avoid those? I believe, personally, C5 palsy is completely related to foraminal stenosis. I think that somehow the, either the foraminal stenosis increases a little depending on what you're doing, which could happen if you if you don't completely release it and you're, you're increasing lordosis, or there's some cord shift, but the root is tethered in the foramen. So every single thing I do is focused on that foramen. If I'm anterior, I do C4, 5 first, I take out the uncinates, and I put in a big graft. If I'm posterior, I go to C4, 5 first, I release around the roots. Before I start di distracting and compressing the other, other levels, which could impact the foramen, the first thing I do is I wanna protect that root. Um, maybe it's witchcraft, maybe it's voices in my head, but that's what I do.